Hi folks, welcome to part one of our basic chemistry lectures. A lot of folks are intimidated by chemistry. I certainly was as a student. Uh, but one of the things that I discovered when I, I finally got over my fear and really let myself learn it and dig into it is that a little bit of chemistry can make you feel like the master of the universe. Um, and it is also the case that you can understand a tremendous amount of detail about how the world, and in our case, the human body works, by paying attention to the smallest building blocks of matter, which is what we're going to start with today. I always start with this image um, by the brick artist. Um, this person works exclusively in Lego blocks and creates um, really beautiful, evocative pieces um, with very simple building blocks. And that's a metaphor for how our bodies are built. We're made of the same kinds of materials as dirt, <laughs> honestly. Um, and yet, um, we are not dirt. We're far more complicated and lovely than that. So, a note about chemicals, which has become sort of, in our culture at this point, um, a word that strikes fear in the hearts of many. Um, everything... Every little old thing is made of chemicals. This sort of snarky cartoon points that out. So, right, we've got the person drinking out of a cup and the other... I'm assuming it's guy looks kind of guy like says you're drinking dihydrogen monoxide ah and the guy spits it out um, dihydrogen monoxide sounds terrifying in fact um, it can be lethal in large amounts um, you can can also be lethal if you don't have enough of it in your body Dihydrogen monoxide is just another way of describing water. Water is a chemical. It has the chemical formula H2O. Two hydrogens, two hydrogen atoms, and a single oxygen. Prefix di means two, mono means one. All right. So, way, way back in the beginning physical science um, we are going. So matter is defined as anything that takes up space. Another way of saying that is that um, it has volume um, and it also matter also has mass and the two things go always go together. So anything that has mass also takes up space Anything that takes up space also has mass. So that's matter. The other really basic idea is the idea of energy. Um, energy is a little harder to describe. Um, in physics and chemistry, energy is described as the ability to do work. And work, that word refers to changing the form, so think structure, the structure or the position of bits of matter. So we can measure energy um, as we see it being transformed, say, from um, light energy into heat energy. You can, you can measure that. But... Energy doesn't have mass or take up space. And 
if we leave aside dark matter and dark energy, these are the two um, these are the two things that the universe is made of, including the universe of humans. So you, you may be aware that there are different uh, phases or states of matter. If you think way back to middle school science, matter can be solid, a liquid, a gas. Now, it, there are also other states of matter, um, plasma and Bose-Einstein condensates, but we really don't need to concern ourselves with them because they're less Rele directly relevant um, for human bodies. So one of the common misconceptions that students have is that um, that somehow there's a difference in the makeup of matter if it exists as a solid or a liquid or a gas. Um, and in fact, that's not the case. So if you think about solid water, which is ice, liquid water, or water vapor, which is water as gas, they all have exactly, all of those molecules of water have the same chemical formula. Two hydrogens, chemically bound, held together with a bit of energy to an oxygen atom, right? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about solid, liquid, or gaseous water. And the same thing is true for liquid gold, solid gold, gold as a vapor. So what is the difference? Well, to illustrate this for you, um, I've got a couple of animations. On the left, we have uh, single atoms of one kind or another um, inside a sealed container, and we have the ability to change the amount of heat that is being added to the sample inside the container. On the right, we have oxygen molecules, which are two oxygen atoms that are bound to, to one another. And we also have the same set of controls. So let's see what happens. So as we observed in that, um, in that simulation, it is the speed of the particles, whether they're single atoms, small molecules like oxygen gas, or 
large molecules. It's how fast they're moving, which is, in fact, temperature. Temperature is a speed, measurement of speed. Um, it's how fast they're moving and how far apart they are. Doesn't have to do with the composition of your sample. It has to do with how fast things are moving and how far apart they are. Okay, so matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. And mass, think of it as it's, it's related to weight. Um, the smallest complete units of matter um, take the form of atoms. And <clears throat> we have 92 different naturally occurring types or flavors of atoms, and those are called elements. We'll get into later about what it is that makes one element different from a, another in terms of the tiny bits that atoms themselves are created of. So we've got 92 different elements, and those elements, our information about them is collected in something called the periodic table, which is a rather funky looking data table, but more about that later. And all matter that exists in the natural world is made of these 92 different flavors of matter, these 92 different elements. Every element has its own physical and chemical properties. Physical properties are things like um, boiling point, freezing point for this substance. Physical properties also include Things like how soft the material is. Um, chemical properties, on the other hand, that refers to what other elements the element in question will play with, what kind of chemical bonds it will form. And That's something you might also hear referred to as reactivity. Or you might hear somebody say, well, how reactive is oxygen? Meaning how likely is it to engage in chemical reactions, chemical bonds, making or breaking with other atoms? So atoms react with one another and they do that through something we call a chemical reaction, and that is what generates a molecule. Remember from last week, molecules are two or more atoms that are held together as a single unit um, by a small amount of energy. And that bit of what's referred to as potential energy or bond energy is a chemical bond. Now, Everything that exists is built from chemicals, from atoms, right? Um, but most of the molecules that make up living things are of a very particular type, and those are called organic molecules. The definition of organic in the sciences is very, very simple. It has nothing to do with whole foods or synthetic, um, meaning man-made pesticides or fertilizers. It's very simple. Any molecule that has two or more chemical bonds between atoms of carbon and atoms of hydrogen, it's organic. So yes, plastic is organic. Um, quick note about the, the image in this slide. Um, 
This is what's referred to as a ball and stick model. Um, it happens to be an amino acid, which is um, the, one of the small molecular units that makes up proteins that are bound together um, to make up proteins. And the way these models work is that, um, first of all, they're color coded and the color code is usually the same, not something you need to remember, but for your information, oxygen is usually shown as red, carbon is gray or black, hydrogen is white or light gray, nitrogen is blue. So the, the atoms are shown as balls and the chemical bonds are shown as the sticks that connect the balls. One of the most remarkable things about our bodies and the bodies of all living things <clears throat> is that you don't need a huge variety of elements to build a living body. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, throw a little sulfur in there, little phosphorus, boom. You can build organic molecules, complex organic molecules, which is how you begin to build a body. But to understand the more complicated parts of chemistry um, that we really want to understand in order to know how the body functions, we have to sort of back way up and think about just basic chemistry first. Chemistry is all about the building blocks of matter, which are atoms, and how they combine. And I have a picture of Legos here because the way that Legos snap together or this sort of building block snap together, you have um, little bumps on the top and you have sort of one there. You have little openings on the bottom. And although each of those building blocks is a different color, slightly different shape, they all can fit together. They can all be combined um, because they all have bumps and I call the openings on the bottom divots, for lack of a better word. Atoms are just like that. So don't, don't let it get too complicated in your head. Atoms are the smallest complete unit of matter. Um, here is my snarky chemistry joke for the lecture. Um, yes, they are everything. Atoms. Okay. Um, it turns out that to understand how chemical bonds form, which we need to understand to figure out how you build biological molecules, we have to take one more step down in terms of the size of the um, units we consider in the hierarchy of biological organization. So the prefix sub means under, like submarine means under the sea. Subatomic particles are the particles that make up atoms. There are only three. So gold is made up of the same three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, as oxygen, as carbon, um, as sodium. And these three particles have properties called mass and charge. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this lecture. So mass. Mass is how much matter is present in your sample. It might be your sample might be a single subatomic particle or a planet. In either case, the mass of that sample that you have depends only on the number of two of the three subatomic particles. 
So the numbers that I've added at the bottom of the screen, um, which I don't really know how to describe except for um, that they are incredibly tiny numbers. Um, this lowercase g stands for gram. It's the abbreviation for gram, which is the unit of mass that we use in biology. So the first number, the top number, is actually it's red here, um, is the mass of a single proton in grams. And you can imagine what doing calculations with that number would be like. Um, it'd be really prone to error, for example. So physicists and chemists decided, you know what, we're in charge here. We're just going to say, I'm creating a new unit, right? If 12 of something can equal a dozen, and once people learn that a dozen is 12, it's, it's common knowledge. So we're just going to create a new unit, and we're going to call it the atomic mass unit, which stands for, or which is abbreviated AMU. And we're going to say that the mass of a single proton, whatever the heck this number is, is equal to one atomic mass unit. So every time, if for every proton I have in an atom, I have to add another AMU. So if I have one proton, I have one AMU of mass from the proton. If I have 10, then I have 10 AMU of mass from the proton. Now, neutrons are a tiny, tiny bit heavier than protons are. But unless you're a particle physicist, that's not going to really matter. And so they said, you know what? We're going to ignore this that two whatever of a part of a gram and we're going to say it's a rounding error. So a single neutron has a mass of one AMU. Now electrons, electrons do have mass, right? so I want to make that clear, um, but a single electron and I'm just going to abbreviate it this way. Um, so one electron, E for electron, minus, because it turns out that they have a minus charge, negative charge, has a mass that is only roughly one eighteenth hundredth of a single AMU. Well, we don't have atoms that have more than 118 electrons. So for our purposes, and for most per people's purposes in chemistry and biology, electrons have zero mass. What they do have is a tremendous amount of energy because they're moving really fast. More on that later. Okay, particles can also have a property that's referred to as charge. Um, you know you have charge because like charges repel one another. There are two flavors of charge. You've got positive charge and negative charge. Like charges repel. So positively charged particles repel one another. Negatively charged particles repel one another. Oppositely charged particles, however, attract one another. And that's codified in something called Coulomb's Law, which you don't need to remember. We're just going to call it the Law of Electrostatic Attraction and Repulsion. So the force of attraction between charges is 
electrostatic attraction and the force, the, the pushing away force is electrostatic repulsion. Now, this law, if you look at it mathematically, um, tells us that both the repulsive force and the attractive force varies with two important parameters. The first is that the smaller, the force gets smaller as the charges get farther apart. Think of, think of charge as being sort of like magnetism, right? If you're holding two magnets far apart, um, they're actually still attracted to one another, their magnetic fields are, but you can't really see that, or you can't feel it if you're holding them. Um, but the closer you get, the more strength you have to use to keep them apart. These forces get larger as the total number of charges increases. And this is gonna, these ideas are gonna become important when we talk about um, certain kinds of bonding, as well as um, one of my favorite molecules, water. All right, so two flavors of charge, positive and negative. And you kind of might guess from the P in the title that protons are positively charged. Again, a single proton has a plus one charge, 10 protons is going to have a plus 10 charge. Neutrons are called neutrons because they have no charge. They are neutral. Electrons, although they are virtually massless, do have a charge that is equal in size but opposite in sign to the proton. So electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, neutrons have no charge. So which particles are going to attract one another? Well, protons, which are positive, and electrons, which are negative, are going to attract one another. Which will repel one another? Well, protons are going to push away from other protons. Use arrows here to show that attraction. Um, and electrons are going to push away from other electrons. This idea of electrostatic attraction and repulsion is going to help us explain the structure of the atom. All right, so quick summary, three subatomic particles that are used to create the 92 different kinds of atoms, which we call elements. The smallest complete unit of, that, of an element is called an atom. All matter, which is anything that has mass and takes up space, <clears throat> is made of atoms. The mass of a single proton is one atomic mass unit, and a single proton has a charge of plus one. A single neutron has a mass of one AMU, but it has zero charge. A single electron has a mass of for our calculation purposes, zero AMU, it has a charge of minus one. So if I have 10 protons, I have 10 positive charges and a mass of 10 AMU. If I have 10 electrons, I have a mass of zero AMU but a charge of negative 10. If I have 10 neutrons, I have a mass of 10 AMU, but no charge. All right.
we will use that information in our next video.